Shall we pray? May the words of my mouth and the thoughts of our hearts be acceptable to you, our Lord and our Redeemer. Amen. During the General Assembly, there was during one of the debates a discussion about team ministry and about parish groupings, the like of which we are forming with our neighbours at Blairdaff Chapel of Geary, Echt and Bidmar, Kemney Tintor, and of course us at Cluny and at Manimask. The debate, the debate focused in part not in substance, but on the name of these teen ministries going forward. Whether it would be hub or whether it would be parish grouping or whatever. And I'm not sure we got a full answer, save to say that hub now doesn't seem to be a, a name that they like to use. But what's in a name? I hear you ask. Of course, those of you who know me know that I'm not a follower of Shakespeare. But I do know this quote, though, to be frank, I didn't know where it came from. I just knew it was Shakespeare. What's in a name, he said? That which we call a rose by any other name would smell as sweet. I had to look it up. It comes from Romeo and Juliet. You know, names do matter. Getting the right name for a project does make a difference. You might think it's very superficial, and often it is but it can influence others. Names matter. As you might know, I don't know if I've told you before, but I support Dundee Football Club. We play our games at the home of Scottish football, Dens Park, and we've been there for over 100 years. But our current owners want to move away from Dens Park to the outskirts of the city to a park called Camperdown Park. They have bought some land adjacent to Camperdown Park where they're hoping to build a major complex which along with other things will have a 15,000 seater stadium for Dundee to play in. But they'll also have shops, a hotel and even, yes, a crematorium, among other things. But some fans don't like the thought of moving away from our traditional heartland of Dundee Football Club at Dens Park. But others have caught on because they realise that Dens Park is not in the right place. It doesn't have the best facilities. It can't be used for much apart from playing football. In brackets, do you see anything that sounds like that? The right places and the right spaces? Close brackets. There's only one thing that's going for it. And that is some of the comedians have decided in Dundee that they're going to call this new stadium Campy New. In reference to Barcelona, that great football team stadium called Camp the New Camp. Campy is short for Camper Down in Dundee. And so we are now going to be playing at Campy New. Uh, and although that's supposed to be humorous, it's actually caught on. People have got on board because of this name, Campy New. The name makes a difference. Of course, if the stadium ever gets built, it's still to be decided. And if it's ever named, it will not be called Campy New. But for a generation of Dundee fans, we'll think of it as Campy New. Names make a difference. In the fourth century, a, a great church father and major theologian of the time, St. Augustine, in one of his writings, declared the book of 12 prophets, the minor prophets. And that name is stuck. That name is stuck with all that the word minor brings to it. Augustine, it is said, never intended there to be any derogatory description by using minor. He simply called the minor because they were the smaller of the writings of the prophets. But it's kind of stuck, and it's had an influence. So much so that I can tell you passages from Isaiah or Jeremiah or Ezekiel, some of the major prophets, but sometimes some of the good stuff in the minor prophets are hardly looked at. And yet, as I read earlier, there are so many important wee bits in these short books. I was looking at them, and I have to tell you, I couldn't even put them in order which was quite embarrassing. And so I thought over the next wee while to look at the minor prophets. 
You may remember the story when Jesus was visiting his hometown in Nazareth. Like any good Jew on the Sabbath, he went to the synagogue. And when he went to the synagogue, being recognised as a leader and rabbi, he was handed the scroll of the prophet Isaiah. He read a passage and he said, Today that writing has come true. And there was a rami. The point I want to show you is he was handed a scroll of the prophet Isaiah. In these days, there was no books, of course. There were scrolls and they were handwritten and copied. And Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel each had scrolls themselves. But what I've called the minor prophets, or Augustine called the minor prophets, they were all written on one scroll. And that scroll was given the title, The Book of the Twelve Prophets, which has a much more grand appearance than simply saying the minor prophets. It's all in a name. And these twelve prophets, in order in our Bible, are Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. And you know, that order was not the order that was originally written in the scrolls all these centuries ago. Because I'm told, or at least I read, that when the original Hebrew was translated to Greek so that the Hebrew people could have a wider spread of people reading their works, the scholars who translated the Hebrew into Greek decided well, they'll do it in some sort of order. Not the order that was there originally, which kind of gave you in a chronological order. And these scroll, these 12 prophets cover quite a ground. The youngest, the newest, are about 430 BC. The oldest go up maybe up to 850 BC. The original authors had tried their best to make it continue one after the other in a chronological order. But when they translated it to the Greek, it became the larger ones first. And so we have the order we have today. The scroll in the old times might have looked a bit like this. It might have started with Jonah, who's one of the oldest of the prophets, writing to about 780 to 850 BC. Then there was Amos, and then Hosea, Obadiah, Joel, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. In some ways there's similarities, but in others they've been mixed out a wee bit, simply to fit the times. However, before we look at the original documents themselves, the 12 of the original tribes, I want to think it might be worthwhile refreshing our minds. Just what is prophecy? When I hear that someone says they're speaking with a prophetic voice, I sometimes imagine that this person's looking to future. But that's not really what biblical prophecy is about, though. But it does impact on our future. When you encounter prophecy in the Bible, it usually refers to, mes to a message claiming to be of divine nature or origin coming from God. Since most of the Bible focuses on the ancient Israelites' relationship with their God, it makes sense that most of biblical prophecy comes from God. The message comes in many forms. It can be a dream. It can be poetry. It can be a sermon and even a play. And sometimes even dramatic physical stunts. I don't know if you remember, but Isaiah went three years without any clothing to signify the Assyrians would strip and shame the Egyptians and acted out prophecy. Although I've said it's easy to think of prophecy as a message concerning the future, the prophets of the Bible spoke of the past, of the present, and yes, of the future. For it was common for a prophet to reference past events in, in Israel's history, usually the stories coming from the Torah, the first Five books of our Bible. These stories usually serve to remind Israel that they are special pact with God. If Israel remained loyal to God, they would enjoy blessing and protection. If not, things would go against them. That's why the prophet often brought up both the acts of kindness that God showed Israel, along 
with times when God judged the nations. You know, they often mention God freeing this Israel from slavery, or judging the Egyptians with plagues, parting the Red Sea, or claiming the territories. It's quite a difference. They come up again and again in these times using old stories to help with current teaching. And it's that current teaching that we'd have some aspect of work. It was quite common for them to speak on issues such as worshipping gods of other nations. That was a no-no. Show more confidence in armies rather than in God. That's a no-no. Israel's rich citizens oppressing the poor. Israel having a corrupt system of justice. Or world nations violently taking, attacking other nations. They didn't like that. Or kings considering themselves as gods. And prophets called out in the present day when they saw these things happening. And we have prophets today calling out these same things. Our former moderator did that two weeks ago at his farewell speech in a prophetic voice. But also the prophets speak to the future. Some of them are specific to Israel, some of them to the world, often to anyone who's listening. They warn about God's judgment on Israel. Under the Torah, under the guidance of Moses in the wilderness and other places, the people of Israel enjoyed God's blessing and protection if they followed his law. But if they betrayed him, they, they incurred his judgment. God would take away his protection and allow Israel to be consumed by larger, more powerful foreign nations. And the prophets often warn the Israelites that the oppression and idol worship is leading them towards that future. But then they also speak about God's restoration of Israel. In the book of Deuteronomy, the prophet Moses foresees Israel violating the law, enough to get them exiled from their land. However, he also sees God regathering the descendants and bringing them back home. Throughout the Old Testament, the prophets anticipate this restoration, particularly a restoration of Jerusalem. They envision, envision God ruling the restored nation of Israel from a holy city, sometimes through a messianic descendant of King David. Then they speak about God judging the nations. Those who were against the Jews. Those who didn't see God as a divine supreme being. And so they warned the nations. They also spoke about God restoring the nations if they repented, if they were sorry. But the problem with prophecy in the Bible is it's not always clear. I wish it was on this certain day, at this certain way, if you don't do this, something would happen, but it doesn't work like that. Sometimes you need to try and read behind the lines. They're not always clear, they're not always direct, the statements about what's going to happen. For example, Jesus, Peter and Paul were convinced that the Old Testament prophets anticipated Jesus' resurrection from the dead. But according to the accounts of Jesus' life, in the Gospels, Jesus' closest followers didn't really understand that until he had to explain it to them. After he'd already died and come back to life. Beyond this, we often the prophets will blend the future with the present, with the past. And sometimes they speak in language that doesn't mean too much to us now, using images that we need to try and tweak out. And sometimes the prophecies are not fulfilled at one time. For example, God promises David a son, a descendant who will rule Jerusalem forever. And part of that prophecy is fulfilled. David did have a son called Solomon who ruled Jerusalem, but not forever. But other parts went unfulfilled for a long, long time. And while Christianity claims Christ is that promised king, the Jews are still waiting for a Messiah to deliver them. Prophecy 
is not easy. But it's part of scripture. It is God inspired, so we should try to read it. And especially these parts that we don't look at too often. The book of the Twelve Prophets being a prime example. In the end of in the end of the day, each minor prophet is a voice crying out in the wilderness of their time. And their voices are well worth listening to. Amen. Now we're going to sing again. As the deer pants for the water, so my soul longs after you. <laughs> 